So this is a, a somewhat informal session that was kind of inspired by John's session um, that I was kind of hoping John would stay up here for, but he ran away. Um, oh. Basically, uh, back. that would be great if you're, if you're willing. I don't want to force you up here. Um, <coughs> um, but yeah, the idea was to make the audience speak and find out from you like what your experience is working in environments like John's. Is anyone working in environments like this where you have a lot of people having to do builds together? I mean, this is kind of a common problem that many of us face where I think probably for most of the people in this room, you are supporting at least a handful, sometimes quite a large set of writers who have to publish content uh, often from different places to different, two different places. And how is that managed? And I thought that presentation was pretty cool. There was stuff in there that really made me want to go back and start examining some of the things we do and see what we can do differently. Um, in particular, the, the graphs you showed of CPU load during the toolkit builds. It's like we have a lot of data that we collect from all of our builds, but I don't think I've tracked it to CPU builds against a particular like, map that's building in the toolkit yeah. and see where things are tracked. And that, that I find kind of fascinating. Um, well, we, we haven't done it either. I just saw, when I saw the shapes of these curves, mm -hmm. it made me want to know, I see a repeating pattern there. I wonder yep. what's going on in this cycle. You know? Yeah. Well, um, one question I had when you were talking about average loads, uh, or like average build times and things like that, um, you know, they go from three minutes to over 400 minutes. Is that purely like conversion time, or is there other stuff that's going on? Um, well, there... Yeah, there's other stuff going on. So um, if there's any um, like Maven dependencies, so if a writer says they want to use version, uh, like right now we're doing a, a user acceptance test, beta testing, right? Mm -hmm. And if they want to participate in that test, they go into their, their, their project's POM file and they say, I want to use version 6.4.0-3572 right, of, of our pipeline. And if they've never, or, um, um, so when that hits the Jenkins server, and um, it's gotta go download all that stuff. So that's taking time, right? It's gotta mm -hmm. check out the stuff from, from the Git repo into the Jenkins workspace, right? That's mm -hmm. gotta happen. But what I'd like to do is have these, um, these split times that's why I, w I wanted to be able to, like, for what's going on in the log right there, what was happening in the build. Yep. And it could be OT, it could be something else, right? It could be running our Schematron tests, it could be running our unit tests, um, and that way we could probably tweak it a lot better mm -hmm. if we had that, that information, so. Yeah, like in our environment, those build times when we're collecting, like an average build takes this long, you know, that, you know, at least as the author sees it, you know, it takes me 25 minutes to preview my map, but that includes cloning of an entire Git repository onto a build machine. And that clone alone for massive repositories can take several minutes and things like that. And so, yeah, we haven't, like we have some of the stats where we could break it down to the toolkit is doing this, but we haven't really done that much yet, uh, largely because we're supporting so many different styles of builds that the toolkit's just one among many, so it's, yeah. it's harder to pick out. But yeah, um, I mean, among the audience, like, I'd like to get a sense of like, how many writers do most of you tend to support? Like, are there a lot of people that are in the, the hundreds, or like over 100 like John is? A few, a handful, not too many. Anybody who is supporting over 100 writers but was afraid to raise their hand the first time? Uh, what's that? 200. 200, okay. Anybody beat 200? I do have stickers. <laughs> I, the, the winner gets a sticker. <laughs> I think, I don't actually know what our number is right now. It was 40 or 50 when I started. I think we're up to 60 or more writers right now, but yeah. Um, and the other thing that I've wondered, I was gonna actually um, put up a, uh, a poll on our Microsoft team site it's like you know why to, to the writer saying why are you so pushy it but it was just to get them to say why do you push so when you push to the repo are you pushing because you want to see output or because you want to do it as a backup right you want to get it off your machine 
up onto the server. Um, because if it's happening automatically, it makes me wonder, are they even looking at the output of some of these things? And if you're just doing a push to save, why are you running all of these, re the rendering part? Because yep. you don't have to do that if that's all you want to do. So, you know, if we had a way for somebody to indicate, you know, this is a different kind of, this is just a save-only mm -hmm. push, yep. I don't need to see the, the output. I have a lot more left to do. I don't, there's no use of seeing this intermediate, you know, 40,000 page, you know, output. Um, and it's, it's wasting money that you're spending in these, these cloud services, right? Because yep. they charge you by CPU. Uh, Roger's had his hand up there for a little bit. Yeah, just a second. I just, just wondered, um, a lot of teams use uh, a commit message convention for that. Uh, and then if you say skip CI or something like that in your commit message, then all of that stuff doesn't happen. That's an, be an easy way to do that. So to, to repeat that for the microphone, Roger said yeah. that a lot of teams use a, a convention in the commit message that will cause it to skip that build. You can have a, a phrase or a tag or something in the commit message that causes it to not do that whole build. Yeah. Yeah. Are there a lot of people in the audience who use Git as their source control? Wow. Do any of you love it? There are people in the back. I wouldn't be surprised that people who love Git are the same ones who hide in the back of a conference. <laughs> it's, where the, it's where the developers tend to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, were you trying to raise your hand over here? Yeah, yes. I just have a question. Yep. That if you make a publication which is more than 100 pages, are people reading it? So the question, if you make a publication that's more than 100 pages, are people reading it? And how, how many pages was the one you mentioned? Yeah, you said 40,000. 40,000. 40, 40, yeah, it's like the, the, the software that manages like 3G and 4G networks. It's yeah, pretty yeah. big, but it, it depends who you say, who do they read it? So yeah. is it your R&D reviewers? Unless you tell them what's changed, they're not going to go look for this, you know. Um, if it's your customers, right? Um, are they going to read it? That's why uh, we want to move, we're trying to stop using the word documentation um, and use user assistance because user assistance encompasses things like chat bots and then using machine learning to help improve the results and you know all of the content that we generate usually it's all static. It, but if, you, if your help system can actually ask the application that it's helping, um, tell me a little something about this session, right? You may be a customer who's using only this, 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 and this. Why do I need to show you every option in the documentation? That's one of the reasons it can get to 40,000 pages, because you're covering all of these use cases. Um, and so... It shouldn't, shouldn't use split it up, though. Use what? Excuse me? Shouldn't you split it up? Shouldn't you split, split up the documentation? If you have 40,000 pages, yeah. I really know what Well, it's not one document, but yes. So the move is to move uh, into um, uh, feature-based, um, let's say, documents or microservices. Yeah. So software architectures are moving towards microservices. So we're being asked to produce micro documents <laughs> that are about the same size and features so now something that, you know, you could do that maybe in 50 pages, right? Um, and so, but our mindset, even though DITA allows you to have, you know, as big of a map or small of a map as you want, it's, um, there's still this mindset of, okay, we're, our products have like quarterly releases and the documentation's got to be ready for that quarterly release, right? Um, but now if, a lot of our products now are all going to be hosted in uh, in clouds, and in cloud software like you know, um, like the Google Docs, right? They do several pushes to production a day. So if their tests, user acceptance automated tests, show green, 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 we didn't break anything, they push um, the software update. Now to get the writers to be able to respond in that same time frame with that level of granularity is going to be a real change of habit. I yeah. don't know yet how we're going to do it or how well we will be able to do it. Um, there's a lot of 
of relearning, rethinking, um, to, in order to allow that, right? Because we're thinking in monolithic volumes and monolithic time scale, and now they're both shrinking. Yeah. You know. Also, we work in, in my company. We, I work on the Oracle cloud infrastructure, and of course, the cloud stuff goes out every day. And I think more and more of the documentation is in that little microservice size. Um, so we call them standalone services. So whenever a specific service goes out, the map for that service can be published immediately. And that can be done any day, every day. Uh, How do you know, has it been reviewed? It's up to the writer. Like the writer does the push. It's not automated that okay. it goes out. Gotcha. So yeah, the writer generally times it. So when the writer knows that the service has gone live, and the writer can block that because you know, if documentation is a critical sign-off point for the, the release. So the writer can say, we're not done. Um, but once the service goes live, the documentation gets pushed. Gotcha. That's great. I like the sound of that. Um, but yeah, are, we are the writers embedded in the software teams? Like, are they in their scrum meetings and everything <clears throat> so they really know, you know, daily what might be changing or? For us, I think that varies. The, the writing management is all in one group. And so the writers all sit together as much as anybody sits together now that we're all at home. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, but they work with the teams. Hmm. Yep. So, yes, uh, Young, I saw you had your hand up earlier. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, um, more and more I feel like I'm from uh, another planet. Okay, Young from another planet, yes. working on solutions that take away the whole concept of publishing a map. Actually, I'm taking the whole map out of the equation and making, uh, well, it's, it's a shame that fluid topics, the name is already taken, but you know, it's <laughs> way more fluid than anything. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole different way of looking at things. I will be doing a, a flash talk today that yes. is around a bit of a toolkit, and I have something else. Right. Comments, but so, so for the recording. How, uh, how, why we do all this crazy build stuff, etc., when there's other solutions? Uh, so, for for the recording, I'll note that for people watching later, catching up on this after the fact, Yang will be having a presentation later that makes all of us obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes you more effective. Oh, sorry, more effective, not obsolete. <laughs> yes. Yeah, actually, for our next gen help center, we throw away the TOC. It's built on the fly using metadata, um, and it does faceted search, um, like when you go shopping. So um, that, that's kind of new, right? It's like mm -hmm. there's no static TOC anymore. It's built on the fly depending on all, all kinds of factors in the future. But mm -hmm. um, so kudos for, to Mika for figuring out how to do that. Um. Yeah, I, I guess one question for the audience. How, how do you tend to split things up in terms of, like, are people publishing all day, every day, or is it a quarterly thing? Like, are a lot of people dealing with, you know, must publish any time? Some? Nobody? Is anybody in the audience still publishing? <laughs> <laughs> they publish any time? Yeah. I, I would imagine more and more people are being forced that way, even if they don't want to. Um, certainly for software, anyway. Uh, hardware tends to be more production schedule based, but. Yeah. Is anybody doing. Uh, Sorry, I, I, mean, oh. I don't yeah. understand it, but so if you make a publication, I think that uh, within getting a, new, a, a cup of coffee, you mm -hmm. should see your results. And we are doing that constantly also for hardware, mm -hmm. for making hardware. Yeah. Um, but you really need to split up your uh, the thing that you describe. Yeah. That, that it fits in five. That you can generate the, 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 the publication in five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Because else, yeah, it just goes to the the big, huge manual that nobody is reading. Yeah. Again, from the for the recording. Also did yeah. That. He created these huge manuals, but then. I, I, again, just for the recording, that uh, there's generally an expectation, or should be an expectation, that should have basically a five-minute turnaround on your publications. You should be able to see what's up there and get things out. And 
I think that does require the, the smaller piecemeal microservice type approach for documentation as well. Yeah, when I, when I looked at the build times and I saw the ones that are finishing, you know, four, five, six minutes, um, some of those repos have the letters MS in front of it, which means microservice, which indicates it's a smaller, you know, content chunk, and they're able to get out pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, it's important. We're not quite there yet, but because it takes a lot of information architecture work to get there and train your writers to think that way and work that way. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it is hard to break up the old manuals, and if you have something that's been around for a little while and takes a long time to build, it, you can get a lot from breaking it up, but it requires a lot of investment, and that's <laughs> it's not always easy to justify. Yeah. Yes, Frank. Um, I'm wondering, because we're, we're, we're talking about scaling up here, um, so you're large companies, um, both Oracle and Nokia, so, and you've got many writers, how many tooling experts do you have? Because what you do and what you accomplish there, John, is quite a lot. Uh, I wonder how, how large your team is to, to get that going. It's a question about how to scale up to solutions like the ones we're talking about. Um, well, it, it's, it's varied, but we basically <coughs> have, um, let's say, four um, senior developers um, including myself, although I don't do a whole lot of development anymore. Um, and then we have, um, we use, uh, you know, interns and co-op students. Um, um, they're, it, it's a trade-off because this is such a specialized field that very few of them come out of university, even if they're in a master's program. They never heard of XSLT or, or DITA or any of that, at least in our neck of the woods. It may be in Europe, it may be very different. Um, and so we have to spend a lot of time teaching them and mentoring them. And I turn into a teacher again. Um, and although that does have certain rewards, um, when you've got deadlines, it's really tough to have interns working on time sensitive things if they haven't stayed around long enough so that they're, they're fluent. Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so yeah, that's, um, and even when I worked at Freescale, I think there were about eight developers who were working on that pipeline. And they were using Takedo um, and XHive back then. Um, so um, yeah, it takes a company who can afford to spend developer salaries, you know, doing that stuff. Or, you know, you, you go and, and buy a solution that, so you don't have to go do that. <laughs> um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's out there and it's close enough to what you need. Yep. You know. So I, I have the counter experience that everywhere I go, all anyone wants to talk to me about is XSLT. It's amazing. <laughs> I guess I must be lucky. Now, um, <laughs> I'm the only one on my team that really knows XSLT. <laughs> uh, I, I work on a team right now that has five developers on it. And uh, I should clarify, you asked about like Oracle being a big company that does this. Uh, my team supports Oracle Cloud, which is a, you know, it's a big group, but it is a small part of Oracle overall. And there's a much larger dot group that supports the wider Oracle. Uh, for whatever reasons, we have our own little dot group that does the cloud stuff. Uh, so I can't speak so much to that larger group. I'm actually not even sure how many developers they have. Um, but yeah, our team supports the processing pipeline that we use for all our cloud docs, and uh, as well as the site that it goes on. And yeah, we have five people now. We had more last year, um, but yeah. Yeah, it's because you're in the cloud group, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. that's our benefit too. But the database group at Oracle probably doesn't do pushes every day out to the public. Not to the public side, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think. Um, they may internally, right. nightly builds or whatever yes. daily builds. Yeah, they definitely have builds going yeah. all the time because I follow some of their Slack channels and I know they have builds going all the time. But yeah. there are a lot of different, I mean, Oracle makes a lot of different products and most of them use that larger tool set. And yeah, it gets a, gets a lot of use. <laughs> yeah. uh, any other, oh, George is about to show something, three minutes. Okay. 
Does anybody else want to talk about the, the issues they've encountered scaling up? Like, has anybody tried to go from desktop to cloud and hit issues, or tried to scale up from five authors to 20 and run into problems? No. It's gone smoothly for everybody. I love when I hear that. Oh, yes. So the, the question there is really, how do you get SMEs more involved? And they probably don't want to look at data, so how do you get them involved in the process? And yeah, for, for us, I think that we build the previews so they can review the HTML. And so we have a preview server. I saw on your slide that you've got a preview server. And yeah, they don't, they don't know or care what data is. And they look at the HTML and comment on that. But any others? Has anybody managed to get their SMEs involved in the data content? Using a CCMS. CCMS, yes. A couple of scenarios from reviewing PDFs and annotating PDFs if the SME is strictly interested in the final output up to every dot and every detail of rendering. Some are. Some, are. Uh, some intermediate set is what you mentioned, HTML. And if they are really willing to contribute to content themselves, hands on, then we tend to have this combined data and markdown, where SMEs provide their own topics in markdown. Mm -hmm. So it depends on an SME and uh, how the group works. Oh, George says we're out of time. So that's no, the final no, word. No, I, uh, oh, you have a comment. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, you you're, you're, you're allowed to have questions. <laughs> so, so in our case, we try to aggregate inside the Jira issue because all the documentation is updated in response to an issue. And the commits to the documentation code the issue ID. So we aggregate all the changes to the documentation inside the data issue by, with a script that will inject automatically a message with the links to the modified topic. So our subject matter experts are the developers that need to review the documentation. So a developer that was involved in the issue can see exactly what changed to the documentation and uh, review only those topics. So we make available the div, uh, the published version of those topics, and uh, also an editor to edit to provide suggestions if they find something. So I'm curious, one thing we, we talked about scaling up here, what, what do people in the audience consider like high volume publishing? Is it a few thousand topics a week or a few thousand published pages a week? Is it tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Anybody? Like, if you were to say high volume and I said, yeah, we publish 5,000 pages a week, is anybody going to laugh at that? Because that's nothing to them? No? 5,000 a lot? I, I honestly don't know. Like I came in thinking we do high volume, but then I look at our numbers and I have no idea what others consider high volume. Like if you were to pick a number that you thought was high volume publishing, where would it be? Well, just our biggest products because they take the longest to build. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I was trying to, oh, excuse me. I was trying to do some, um, some counts and all of that, but it needs, it needs, you know, more work. I, I just had to do a lot just to come up with the, the rough yeah. uh, numbers because we're not integrated into the analytics part of the, the build chain. So, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have, we have one published that goes out every week that has 80,000 files, but I mean, it's SDK documentation. So it's not like a manual that somebody's going to read. It's reference material. Uh, so it's not coming out of data. But 80,000 seems like a lot to me because I watch the load on the server increase every day as it, or every week as it goes out. But yeah. If we're trying to generate as much of the documentation as can be automatically generated by a script. So for example, for release notes, it, it can go into um, Jira, query Jira, convert that to DITA, create the DITA maps and all the DITA topics, 
And, you know, it can be seen in HTML or, um, um, you know, or PDF, but that really, you know, saves time if somebody has taken the effort to put the, the, the links in there to do that kind of stuff. All right. Well, I don't feel like I got an answer to that, so I'm going to query every one of you during the break as to what you consider high volume publishing. Now, um, I think it's time for the PDF theming to start. Is that right? All right. <laughs>